Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for our final lecture here on reducing your risk of chronic disease. So we already talked about cardiovascular disease, heart disease in its many forms, and now we're going to talk about some of the other common forms of chronic lifestyle-related diseases in the U.S., some things to know and look out for about them, and then lifestyle behaviors that you can take to minimize the chances of developing a chronic disease. So what is a chronic disease, first of all? Contrary to something like a communicable disease, one that is spread by a virus or bacteria, chronic diseases typically develop gradually, slowly, over months and often years, and they're heavily related to lifestyle factors. That's why they're often called lifestyle diseases, because they're related to things that we do or don't do in our lives. And unlike communicable diseases, things like polio and chickenpox, the symptoms for chronic diseases often cannot be cured. They typically can be managed, treated, um, or dealt with to limit the symptoms in some other way, but they can't be cured. So this is a challenge with this subset of diseases, making them so um, potentially fatal and dangerous, but also just having such a, a big impact on your quality of life. And we care about this because not only can it have such a big impact, but it happens to many of us. So the most recent data by the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, says that six out of 10 adults in the US, 60%, have some kind of chronic disease. And this is up from about five in 10 last year. And part of that is the changes in blood pressure guidelines that we talked about in the last lesson. And frighteningly, 40% or four in 10 of adults in the US has two or more chronic conditions. And again, not only can these potentially be life-threatening, but they can have a huge impact on our quality of life. So let's look at some of the data on this. So looking at chronic disease and age, you'll see that over time from about 2008 to, this is, this is in 2014, so about a decade, the rates of chronic disease per age haven't changed very much, but you'll see that with increasing age, the um, amount of adults who have a chronic condition goes up. So if you look at 20 year olds, or right down here, 18 to 44 year olds, our youngest age bracket, about 20% of us have a chronic condition. As you go up in age, you see from 45 to 64, about half. And then as you go up even further in age, 65 years and above, the vast majority of people have a chronic condition, 81% or above. So this doesn't just mean that the behaviors that you're doing in old age are causing people to get sick. It's the accumulation of behaviors over time, lifestyle habits over time. And again, we know that these rates have, even in more recent years, slightly gone up across all age groups. What kinds of condition are, conditions are the two major things? Well, hypertension, high blood pressure like we talked about last time, and high cholesterol are two of the most common conditions. And oftentimes these two conditions don't have any symptoms, but they do lead to dangerous outcomes like stroke, heart attack, congenital heart disease, etc. like we talked about last time. And this used to say one in four U.S. adults has hypertension, but now it's one in two, and that's largely based on the changed guidelines for high blood pressure by the American Heart Association that we went over last class. We also see mood disorders quite high, and we know that these are even higher in teens and young adults in pretty ec epidemic proportions in the last decade or so, with roughly 33% of college-age students having symptoms that would classify them as having major depression. Not necessarily all of these students or student-aged people being uh, diagnosed and treated, but that's what the data say. Diabetes, we'll talk about. Um, chronic respiratory conditions, joint disorders, arthritis, asthma, etc. So we're going to look at some of these now. These, these are some of the big ones. Um, in addition to our two leading killers, one we already talked about, which is cardiovascular disease, and the other which we will talk about, which is cancer. So here are the ones we're going to look at today. Type 1 and 2 diabetes, a couple different forms of lung disease, cancer, osteoporosis, and arthritis, all of which can have 
extreme consequences on quality of life. So what is diabetes? Most simply, it's the inability to properly produce or use insulin. What the heck is insulin? Insulin is a hormone that we produce in our pancreas, which is an organ in our digestive system, and it helps us turn the sugar that we eat in foods into energy. And you'll recall from our nutrition section that all carbohydrate foods, whether they're a piece of cake or an apple or a whole grain slice of bread, get broken down into sugar, the most simple form being glucose. And Insulin is the hormone that helps us utilize that glucose. So it basically helps us get all the energy from these foods into our cells. And insulin is super cool because it increases in our body relative to how much carbohydrate we consume. So if you consume um, like a really big carbohydrate breakfast, you have a Pop-Tart and a bowl of oatmeal and a glass of orange juice, you're going to produce more insulin than if you have a mixed meal breakfast, like a um, bowl of oatmeal and some eggs, right? So you're going to produce more carbohydrate and more quickly if you're having just carbohydrate than if you're pairing it with something else. So basically, let me go over these really quickly. There are two basic kinds of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, that we're going to go into. And we'll look at how insulin plays a role in each of these diseases. I believe I have it in here, yes. So most basically, like I said, glucose is required for everything that happens in our body, almost all of our cells to exist. It is the only fuel source for our brain under normal conditions. It is the main fuel source for our muscles and many of our essential organs. And it is required to get into the cell to provide us with energy to turn into ATP. But in the case of diabetes, we can't get into the cell because we either aren't producing enough insulin or our cells become insulin resistant. So we'll look at that in a minute here. But when you're looking at um, blood sugar levels, we often measure fasting blood sugar to assess whether someone is producing and utilizing insulin well and keeping their blood sugar in a healthy range. So a normal fasting blood sugar range is 70 to really 99 milligrams per deciliter. So if you went to the doctor and you got a blood sugar draw and um, they were measuring the amount of sugar in your blood and you hadn't eaten yet in the morning or you hadn't eaten in three plus hours, this is what they would want to see. If they saw something in the 100 to 125 range, that's considered pre-diabetes, meaning you're not classified as having diabetes yet, but there's a risk for the development. And finally, a blood sugar level of 126 milligrams per deciliter or above is considered diabetes. There are a number of other tests that they'll do as well, like testing hemoglobin A1C, and that's an assessment of someone's blood sugar over a prior three-month period. Um, but this is kind of the first standard test they'll do. And ideally, if someone has healthy functioning insulin, their blood sugar would, should return back to fasting levels between 30 minutes and two hours after eating. That means that insulin has spiked, it has taken the glucose and brought it to the cells where it needs to be used, and it's been used. It doesn't stay there floating around in the blood, which can be dangerous. So when we look at our two different primary types of diabetes, we have type 1 and type 2. Its technical name is diabetes mellitus, which literally means honey urine, which sounds a little yucky, but that is a side effect or a symptom of diabetes is that there's extra glucose in the urine, and so it smells sweet. And so before they had other more sophisticated ways to assess for diabetes, that was actually one way that they would test it. So type 1 diabetes is not a lifestyle disease. It's actually an autoimmune condition where the body, an autoimmune condition is one where the body attacks itself in some variety of ways. And in this case, the body attacks the pancreas and the pancreatic cells that produce insulin. And so now there's not enough insulin around to bring blood sugar into cells. So let's say you eat a piece of birthday cake and you dump all this glucose into your blood. Normally your pancreas would be like, I know what to do here. Pump out a bunch of insulin and your insulin would be like a friend who carries your glucose into your cells. However, because your pancreatic cells have been damaged, 
they can't pump out insulin and glucose just floats around in your bloodstream. And if this gets really high, it can be quite dangerous. So oftentimes this disease is um, starts in childhood and is diagnosed in childhood. It used to be called juvenile diabetes, but there's a greater understanding now that type 1 diabetes can start at any time because of damage to the pancreas. So this can happen from a virus or some other kind of condition, and it can in fact start in adulthood. So oftentimes it's diagnosed um, because someone has symptoms including extreme thirst, just constantly thirsty, uh, fatigue because they're not getting the energy that they need out of their food. Weight loss is very common, again, for the same reason, because the energy from their food is just passing right through them. And frequent urination because of all the excess fluid and glucose that is being passed through their digestive system. So these are some of the more common symptoms. And unfortunately, this one can't be altered by lifestyle conditions. People who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes have to inject insulin to metabolize their food appropriately. And they have to work very carefully with doctors and dietitians and health professionals to learn how to do this. And oftentimes it can be really challenging for people at the beginning, but over time people can become pretty adept at use, checking their blood sugar and using insulin multiple times throughout the day. And one little note over here that's pretty frightening um, is the huge increase in cost of insulin drugs are a couple different types of insulin that diabetics can take in the last decade or so. So this is data from the Journal of the American Medical Association showing that the cost of insulin has gone up over 200% in the last decade and it's only continued to increase, making insulin really hard for people to get and this is a life-saving drug. So this is just one thing to consider in some of the inequalities people face around chronic lifestyle conditions, or, or in this case, just chronic conditions, not even lifestyle related. So again, type one is a chronic disease that is auto, an autoimmune condition. It is not lifestyle related. It can happen at any time, and it's because the pancreas cannot produce insulin or it cannot produce enough. Type two, however, is a chronic lifestyle related condition and this one much more commonly happens in adulthood but the seeds of development of type 2 diabetes often start in adolescence so what happens here is not that the pancreas becomes damaged or can't produce insulin it's that the cells in the body actually become insensitive to insulin they start saying no too much you've been around here too often i don't want you to come in and so the issue is that when insulin is chronically high, it's always elevated, which could be from eating too much food regularly or eating too many simple carbohydrates regularly or not pairing carbohydrates with proteins or fats. Then insulin becomes high and over time, this can cause the cells to sort of turn down their receptivity to them. So I liken this to imagine you have a neighbor or a friend or even better, a family member who likes to come over all the time. And every day they come over and they're knocking on your door and they want to hang out and they want to spend hours with you. They want you to cook them dinner. And eventually you've got stuff to do. You've got to do your schoolwork. You've got to study for this class. You've got to go to your job. You might have to take care of kids. You might want to exercise. You have lots of other things to do. You can't constantly be entertaining this family member. So eventually you might tell them, sorry, I'm busy this afternoon. If they keep coming by, you, maybe you'll shut your blinds or you'll pretend you're not home. You won't answer the door. So this is kind of an extreme and silly analogy. But this is a way to think of when insulin is chronically knocking at the door, constantly inundating the cells, the cells get confused and they don't want to let it in anymore. And then what happens if insulin can't come in means that glucose can't either. Either, So even though there's sufficient, sufficient insulin available, it can't do its job to bring glucose into the cell. And this is tricky because oftentimes insulin is not or the answer or is not the only answer, insulin injections, like it is in type 1 diabetes. And you'll see in this little chart below that type 2 diabetes is vastly more common than type 1, accounting for about 90, even 95% of diabetes cases overall. So the lifestyle-related factors are much bigger. And right now, it's estimated that about 10% of the adult population in the U.S. has type 2 diabetes, and 1 in 3 people, 33%, have prediabetes, 
many of whom don't know it. That means that these people are on their way to developing diabetes, but they don't necessarily have any symptoms of it. So symptoms might be common to type 1, where you have fatigue, extreme thirst, frequent urination, but unlike with type 1 diabetes, it will not lead to weight loss and will often lead to weight gain because of the dysregulated metabolism. So you kind of see here on the side blood sugar spikes and dips that can be problematic in promoting the development of type 2 diabetes. So it's showing a sugar spike here. So imagine you just ate, like I said before, a Pop-Tart, a bowl of oatmeal, and orange juice for breakfast. All of those things might be fine in isolation, but when you're combining them all together, you're getting a huge bolus, a big dump of carbohydrate and sugar into your bloodstream. And without any fat or protein or a whole lot of fiber to slow that down, your blood sugar is going to spike really quickly. This is going to move into your bloodstream really quickly. And then your insulin is going to have to spike as well. It's going to go knocking on those cell doors. And the body does not want your blood sugar to be very high, so it's quickly going to try to pump, out, pump that sugar out of the blood and into cells, some of which it will turn into fat if the cells are already full of the glucose that they need. And as a result, we get this big crash, this big dip in blood sugar. And now you might feel hangry, you might feel irritable, you might want to reach for the quickest satisfying snack that's going to bring your blood sugar back up like a muffin or a frappuccino and you're going to start to get this big cycle throughout the day where you have these big highs and lows in blood sugar. And this is one of the worst wet things that you can do to predispose yourself to the development of diabetes. So ideally, we want our blood sugar to be as stable as possible throughout the day. We want this nice, these nice, small, steady waves throughout the day that never get too high and never get too low. And so what can you do to make this happen? Well, think back to our nutrition section. Remember what we talked about in terms of P2F or the plate method. P2F is protein, produce, and fat. You want to include all three of those in a meal and ideally two in a snack. Why? Well, because both protein and fat take a longer time to digest, so they're going to slow down the absorption of glucose, and they don't impact insulin like carbohydrates do. Additionally, produce is often going to have a lot of fiber, which is going to help slow down carbohydrate digestion, so they're going to give us just more of a gradual rise, keeping us fuller longer, keeping our energy sustained longer, and not sending all of those insulin family members knocking at your cells' doors. So this is type 2 diabetes, a chronic lifestyle-related condition that often has to be managed with medication, but can I repeat, can be improved, and I have even seen cases of it being reversed through lifestyle factors, like eating a more balanced diet, including proteins and fats and produce in every meal, exercising regularly, exercise really helps cells uptake glucose, and managing chronic stress. So some of the general risk factors here from the CDC, as you age, your risk increases, being physically inactive will hugely increase your risk for diabetes, again, because exercise helps cells take up glucose. Exercise makes cells glucose hungry. So exercise even can actually help your cells take up glucose without insulin being present. So if you're already somewhat insulin compromised, exercise can really help. Even something as simple as a 10-minute walk post-meal. A family history of type 2 diabetes increases your risk dramatically. There's a huge genetic component. High blood pressure increases your risk. History of gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes means that you developed diabetes during pregnancy when blood sugar regulation can be altered and having extreme excess weight. Additionally, different ethnicity groups have higher risk than others, so things to be mindful of. So you can't control all of these things, but some of them you can. Let's talk about lung disease. Lung disease is the third leading cause of death in the U.S., and we're going to look at some common ones like asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. So asthma is a condition where the lungs' airways swell to restrict airflow, which seems like such a strange thing for the body to do, and there are a wide range of triggers. So again, this is, this is considered like an autoimmune condition. So typically, air will come in through the nose and mouth, travel through the trachea, into the bronchioles, 
into these small sacs called alveoli, which will absorb oxygen and um, they'll transfer oxygen and carbon dioxide with your bloodstream. And that's how you get oxygen into the rest of your body. So in a non-asthmatic person, you have these muscles around your bronchial tubes that are nice and relaxed, allowing air to easily flow in and out. During an asthma attack, these bronchial tubes become inflamed. They thicken and tighten up, and the area in between becomes quickly filled with mucus, making it really, really hard for air to get through. So any of you who have asthma know that this is a really scary condition. And unfortunately, there are a wide range of triggers for this. Um, oftentimes, allergies, so pollen or other things in the environment can trigger it for people. Cigarette smoke can trigger it for people. Cold weather, and some people have exercise-induced asthma, where exercise will trigger this. There are a big variety of triggers for individual people, and, but oftentimes this is present in childhood and can reduce for some in adulthood, though not always. Typically, the medications for this involve some kind of inhaler to help relax the bronchioles and allow air to flow through more easily, and this absolutely needs immediate medical attention. Ideally, if someone is exercising and they have an asthma attack, you want to gradually slow down the intensity of exercise. You don't want to stop abruptly. You want to get into a warm area away from the cold and away from pollutants and use your inhaler. Another common and dangerous kind of lung disease is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You've probably heard of this as COPD, and it actually has two common kinds. One is emphysema, and the other is chronic bronchitis. So if you look at our top picture here, this is a picture of emphysema. Emphysema is a disease that affects the alveoli, those little sacs that I talked about at the bottoms or at the ends of the bronchial tubes in the lungs, which is where oxygen exchange actually occurs. So ideally, we want these nice, big, round sacs with lots of surface volume for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange to occur so we can get our blood nice and oxygenated. However, with emphysema, these bronchial tubes become damaged and these spaces are a lot smaller and compressed or collapsed and harder to exchange oxygen. And this very commonly happens with, with smoking. Smoking is the primary cause of COPD, both emphysema and chronic bronchitis. With chronic bronchitis, this is an impact on the bronchioles themselves. So this is a nice healthy bronchial as we saw before. Chronic bronchitis is an, a chronic inflammation of these bronchial tubes with excess, excessive mucus in between. So again, air can't flow through easily, similarly to asthma, but happening all the time, not just acutely induced. And again, smoking is really the primary cause here, and this definitely has to be managed but with a doctor and medications or oftentimes surgeries um, to prevent further complications. And now <clears throat> let's look at cancer. Cancer is really the name for a group of diseases that are characterized by the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells. And sadly, cancer is the second most common cause of death in the U.S. with staggering rates of of um, development with half of all men nearly and a third of all women developing it in their lifetime. So it's extremely common. It can be managed, beaten, cured um, when caught at certain stages, but it's extremely common and extremely life-threatening. And there are some lifestyle choices that will play a role that we'll look at in a second. So kind of looking at the development of cancer for a second, this is an example of skin cancer. So we see a skin cell that has a genetic mutation. That means this cell becomes abnormal. You see all these other cells doing their cell thing. The DNA is telling, is, is acting appropriately, and the cell is replicating normally, and it's doing its normal skin thing. These abnormal cells will start to divide more rapidly than normal. They'll start to divide and create new cells, which will change form and these cells might stay in place in this abnormal form. And in terms of skin cancer, this would be when you'd see a growth or um, discoloration on your skin. And at times, these cells can become malignant where they'll travel 
to other areas throughout the body. So you can see this one's getting into the bloodstream and traveling to other areas. This is called a metastasization. So the cancer will spread to other areas. That's why you'll often hear of people having lung cancer that spreads to some digestive organs or skin cancer that spreads somewhere else. And this is when, when cancer can become very, very dangerous. So it's a cell with genetic mutations and abnormal growth. And of course, as you can imagine, some genetic mutations just happen randomly and they're outside of our control. So these might be issues in our gene code. These might be, yes, related to genetics um, or lifestyle exp or exposures when we were in utero or very young. But there are some lifestyle things that can have an impact as well. So genetic factors are one big cause and science now knows many uh, forms of cancer that are genetically related. There are other things called carcinogens that can increase the risk of developing cancer because they cause these strange mutations in the cell that causes genetic cell growth. Uh, so carcinogens would be things like exposure to tobacco smoke, exposure to asbestos, which was a common chemical used in buildings in the past. So a lot of chemicals um, if you work in like a factory or a coal mine, you're going to have higher rates of chemical exposure. Even at high levels of alcohol or drug use are carcinogens, will, have, will cause mutations in the cells. Um, radiation, so getting an x-ray done or flying in an airplane is a low dose but can cause small cell mutations. And these things are cumulative over time. Sun exposure is a carcinogen. So extreme sun exposure can cause mutations over time. So there are lots of different things that can act as carcinogens, even things that we find in our food, so like chemicals used on plants and crops to keep bugs from eating them, chemicals used in our makeup or on our uh, bed sheets or furniture as flame retardants. There are unfortunately carcinogens all around us, but it's the accumulation of exposure that increases risk. And then there are lifestyle factors as well that increase the risk of cancer. So not being physically active increases your risk. High alcohol or drug use consumption increases your risk. There is some evidence that high red meat consumption or processed meat, like hot dogs, bacon consumption, increases your risk. Um, so these are all things to consider over time. But again, it's a really challenging thing because say you get cancer at 50, it's hard to look back and point to one exposure. That was the cause. And if you look down here, these are some of the most common types of cancer for um, men and women in the U.S. These are new cases and these are cancer deaths per year. So the most deadly and the new cases. And the pink is for women and the blue is for men. If you want to spend a minute looking at those. Couple more to go over, osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a disease of the bones marked by thinning and brittle bones. So you can see a normal, nice, healthy bone tissue here, this nice bony matrix, and this thinning, brittle, porous bone down here. Over half of Americans older than 50 have osteoporosis or the early stages, which is called osteopenia. It's most prevalent in women Asian and Caucasian women are most likely to get it over the age of 50, and we'll look at why here in a minute. So individuals at greater risk, females, thin, older than 50. If you've broken a bone, that's a high risk factor. Having a low bone density, low bone mass reading if you get a scan, and then having close relatives with osteoporosis. And here's another picture of the development down here, healthy osteoporosis and severe with these big spaces. So common fracture sites would be the hips and pelvis, the um, femur, the bones in the hand or wrist, the lower leg ankle, and didn't have them here but the vertebrae of the spine. And so the reason that females are at greater risk is because of menopause and our changing hormones. So both estrogen and testosterone are protective against bone deterioration for men and women. Women, however, go through something called menopause where they stop having a menstrual cycle and thus produce far greater, far, excuse me, far lower levels of estrogen 
as they age. And this estrogen is very protective against bone health. So once you stop producing estrogen, your bone can much more easily deteriorate. And this is not just in women with menopause, but it's also in younger women who don't eat enough and have dysregulated menstrual cycles from that as well, or who overexercise and have dysregulated menstrual cycles. So if we look at nutritional factors, Simply getting enough calories in is very important for bone development. And then some of the micronutrients that are important are calcium and vitamin D. Both of these are going to help with the development of strong bones. So where are you going to get your calcium? You can get it from dairy foods. You can get it from a lot of leafy greens like kale or chard. And you can get it from a lot of nuts and seeds. Where are you going to get your vitamin D? You can get it from dairy foods. You can get it from the sun. You can get it from fortified foods like orange juice or almond milk, and you can supplement with either of these if your doctor says it's appropriate. And the last, last thing, lifestyle choices have a strong impact on osteoporosis, mainly being weight-bearing exercise. Weight-bearing exercise has a huge protective effect, as we talked about in our resistance training section, on reducing the development of osteoporosis because it puts stress on the bone. And what does our body do when it's exposed to a stressor? It responds by getting stronger. So your body will lay down thicker and denser bone in response to the stress of resistance training. So adding some load to your regular workout is a really good idea. And then lastly, let's look at arthritis. Arthritis is a group of diseases, actually there are multiple different kinds that involve inflammation of the joints. So inflammation, swelling, pain of the joints. This can often cause achiness, stiffness, and sometimes permanent dysfunction or deformation. So two of the most common types are osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is probably the one you commonly think of. This one is related to age and is due to breakdown of cartilage around a joint. So cartilage is um, a denser soft tissue that helps uh, cushion a joint. So when you're moving, you're not rubbing two bones together. So this can happen because of old injuries, because of too much or too little use, meaning you're not moving your joints at all, or you're doing repetitive motions, like swimmer, swimming in the shoulders can have an impact, or running in the knees or hips. Joint deformity, excess weight on the joint, etc. And this is, again, one that develops slowly over time. And then rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition. So again, this is one where the body attacks itself, this time the joints, and it can cause lots of inflammation and pain in the joints that typically requires some symptomatic um, treatment with medications. Exercise is helpful for both of these. It just doesn't need to be too intense or too extreme. So you want to avoid hard-hitting activities, running on hard surfaces, um, impact sports. You want to vary your sports motion. So don't just run or don't just swim. You want to move in different directions and move your body in different ways to lubricate your joints and, um, and groove different movement patterns. You want to move regularly, even if it's just light stretching or walking. And then you can talk to your doctor about if there are potential hormone or nutrition related deficiencies. So lastly, here's kind of a slide that sums all these up. You saw in the beginning that 60% of adults have one chronic condition and a majority of those, two thirds, have two or more. And the reason is that a lot of these chronic conditions have similar roots. So we see heart disease, we see depression and anxiety. We see cancer and diabetes and our, our autoimmune conditions. Many of them have similar roots, and they won't have all of these, but lots of them, or, or one or two of them, might be the culprit. So really, the, the, the trunk of the tree here is inflammation, chronic systemic inflammation in the body caused by any of these factors. High levels of stress, poor diet, high exposure to toxins, not enough sleep, toxic relationships, nutrient deficiencies, not exercising, trauma, genes, digestive issues, etc. These all can lead to inflammation, which is really the fanning the flames for any of these chronic conditions, and it just takes time for them to develop. So I really want you to think about with all that, oops, oops. 
sorry. What can you do now to reduce your risk of chronic disease? Think of your family members and what chronic disease burdens they have and what their lifestyle is like and think about some of the lifestyle factors that you take now that might increase or decrease your risk. How can you change some of these factors that might increase your risk and what factors can you implement that might reduce your risk? I know oftentimes this seems far off. It's hard to change our behaviors for some far away health condition, but the best thing you can do is find some of these behaviors that you actually enjoy doing. So remember with exercise, it doesn't have to hurt to work. Find something that's fun, whether that's golf or walking with friends or swimming or dancing or going to Zumba or whatever it is that's fun for you. Um, find healthy foods that you like to eat. Remember, it's okay to put salt and it's okay to cook your foods in butter or olive oil or things that will make them taste good. You want to get a variety of fruits and vegetables and foods as, as close to their natural form as possible. Circle back to our stress section if you're looking for more methods of managing stress. Find close friends that you can share your life with. This has a huge impact on lifespan and long-term health. And find some meaning or purpose in your life that's bigger than yourself. All of these things will have a strong impact on reducing your risk of chronic disease and improving your quality of life.